Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, over the next seven minutes, I'm going to be talking about the mobility of our children and a dire need to address this topic uh, in our current and future urban planning policy and practice. It's, it's great to follow uh, the presentation from Victoria. It seems like some things are happening, which is, which is great to know. So I'm going to start with um, a question of how do our children experience their cities? Chances are that much of what they know or what they see every day are through car windows or through a, a, a computer screen. I was writing this note last night, and my eight-year-old daughter was sitting beside me, and she said, that's so true. How did you know? And that made me sad. Uh, but the truth is that a third of our children, even in grade five and six, are never allowed to go out on their own. Their parents just don't let them to. They spend too much time driven around by their parents, too much time in front of their screen. Our children's mobility patterns, then, are clearly different from what we may have experienced as children. So the question becomes, how did we get there? Uh, for until about the mid-20th century, streets have always played uh, an important role in, in urban encounters. Neighborhood streets were places where kids would, would play. The pictures over there, the, the one on the top shows uh, it's a 1948 picture, kids playing on a street uh, in Scotland. The, the picture below is from Calgary in 1948, a bunch of high school kids uh, going to school. From there, we have moved to a culture where uh, there's this constant, uh, th there's this perception that children need constant supervisions. They need to be driven around everywhere, and their play has been confined to uh, supervised places where appropriate behavior can occur, which, uh, in a way, uh, has, has significantly reduced what we call the home range of our children. In, in 2007, a British national newspaper published this uh, picture. As you can see, that the, the home range of an uh, eight-year-old son, uh, uh, child Ed, is pointed as a dot somewhere toward the top left-hand corner, he's only allowed to go up to the end of his street, nowhere else. His mother, when she was eight years old, she was able to go to a neighborhood swimming pool, which is about half a mile from their home. His grandfather was allowed to go into the woods, which was several miles from their home. So it's a generational thing. Over, over, over time, we have somehow lost uh, this independence of our children to go out on their own and explore their neighborhoods on their own. If we look at the data from Toronto in the GTHA, even in 1986, uh, nearly half of our children walked to school. Back in 2006, that, 2011, that proportion went down to 32 percent. And much of these trips were replaced by uh, car trips. By by reducing a child's ability to walk, bike, to play, uh, we are actually depriving them from an opportunity to engage in physical activity. And it has a, a whole range of uh, impacts on their physical, psychological, social health. And, and above all of these, our, this pursuit of safe mobility is actually creating a dangerous environment for, for our kids. For any children, for any child aged one year or, or above, uh, vehicle car crashes are the leading cause of death for, for any children. And most of the children, unfortunately, die when they're in the cars. So by, by, by pursuing this safer mobility paranoia, we're not really helping anyone. So the question is, uh, we know that there's a need for change, and how do we get there? So, in the presence of new technology, wireless technology, battery technology with smart cities, there are opportunities to create communities that are shared, where we can create streets that are safer for everyone, 
uh, where uh, parents probably wouldn't have to worry if we do it right. But if we don't do, we may create a generation that one of my friends calls the wall E generation, where no one does anything and, and are completely dependent on autonomous mobility. So we have to be very concerned about that. So within this context and within this picture of a lot of uncertainty, I suggest that, that there are three things that need to happen to create communities where children are, ha children are happy, active, and healthy. First, we need to address uh, this fear of danger and start to target small wins that can slowly change our culture. And things are happening. We see walking school buses uh, that, are, that are popping up where um, the, the main point is that we trust on the community about, about our mobility of the children. In, in about 36, within the TDSB system, we have introduced what we call the loose parts play, which teaches kids to take risks when they're playing, and parents uh, to, to perceive that sometimes risk is fine. And lastly, we are piloting what we call play streets. We did that in a couple of streets in Toronto. It's, it's more popular in Europe and, and, and America, where we're basically closing down streets for class, uh, cars and bringing kids onto the streets where they can play. And again, parents can learn that it's OK uh, to reclaim the streets for, some, uh, for, for kids. Second, we need to design our neighborhoods that actually work for children, uh, for families with children. And ex a great example that I, I, I was uh, fortunate to uh, visit uh, was the Hammersby Fustad uh, in, in Sweden. Some of you probably have, uh, have heard of it. Uh, it's, it's an industrial, uh, industrial waterfront redevelopment in, in, in Stockholm that was actually developed for older adults, but then families with children move in, uh, moved in. There's a lot of things that work for families. It's mixed use, mixed density development, uh, lots of open spaces, less interaction with, uh, uh, with, um, uh, with, uh, with cars and whatnot. Uh, so we, we have examples in front of us that we can learn from. And lastly, if we want to build cities for children, we need to start including them in our decision-making processes. There's a saying that when, when kids wear their urban planning hats, the cities work for everyone. And we should really embrace this philosophy as we go forward and plan for our future cities and communities. So thank you. I wanted to end with that and somewhat shamelessly wanted to promote a book that just came out. Many of the things that uh, I talked about uh, can be found here. Uh, feel free to take a look and uh, we'll chat more. Thank you.